Welcome to the First Church in Chestnut Hill and to our Sunday service for February 20th, 2022. Welcome if it is your first time, welcome if it is your hundredth time. We will start our time together with a reading from the book of Psalms, a portion of Psalm 37. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light, and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they have taken refuge in him. Today, we'll hear about Joseph, an Old Testament figure whose dramatic life story provides an instructive moral example. In recent times, his story has inspired numerous fictional interpretations, including Thomas Mann's majestic novel, Joseph and His Brothers, and Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Visual artists were also intrigued by Joseph's story. Here is a romantic rendering of the reunion of Joseph and his brothers, the subject of today's reading, painted by Henri-Louis Giraudet in 1789 on the eve of the French Revolution. Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons born to Jacob and his second wife, Rachel, and was Jacob's favorite. To show his favor, Jacob gave Joseph a glorious coat. He clearly intended Joseph to become the head of the family and thus of the people of Israel. This clearly didn't sit well with Joseph's 10 jealous half-brothers who abducted, abducted him and sold him into slavery. They also smeared his coat with goat's blood and took it to Jacob, telling him that Joseph was dead. Joseph ended up in Egypt. There, through his uncanny ability to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams, he rose to prominence in court. One of his dreams predicted a famine, which enabled the Egyptians to prepare so that when the famine hit, they remained prosperous. Meanwhile, in Canaan, the Israelites that is, Jacob's clan, were suffering horribly. The 11 brothers went to Egypt to ask Pharaoh for help. Ironically, Pharaoh sent them to Joseph to make their case. They didn't recognize him until Joseph revealed himself to them. In an emotional scene, he is embraced by his younger brother, Benjamin. He then brought the rest of the clan to Egypt and gave them food. Joseph's story served as a guarantee of sorts to the Israelites, that God would preserve them and care for them even despite their sins. The 12 brothers would become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph is an exemplar of faithfulness to the Lord and forgiveness to those who tried to harm him. He's one of a series of Old Testament figures, Esther is another, who rose to power in a regime otherwise hostile to Jews and who used his position to protect his people. Today's reading is the climax of the story. Joseph meets with his brothers after many years, forgives them, asks for his father, and expresses love for them all. Our reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 11. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, 
I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. The reading ends here. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Joseph and his brothers are the sons of Jacob, who in turn was the son of Isaac, and who was in turn the son of Abraham. These brothers and their ancestors, they are the patriarchs of Israel. But that does not mean they were always good or always wise people. Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. Isaac allowed himself to be fooled twice by Jacob. Jacob cheated his brother out of his inheritance and was later cheated by his father-in-law out of his chosen bride. This is a fun family. The sons of Jacob also had lots of problems, most notably for our session when they sold their brother into slavery. Because he was the favorite, because he was so arrogant, because he was the little brother. Time passes and Joseph rises in power in Egypt, 
while the other sons of Jacob, they struggle with the famine that is coming back at home. Our passage this morning marks the reunion of the brothers. Now, to refresh you on the story, Joseph has interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh and predicted the coming of a seven-year-long plague, uh, famine. Joseph's brothers have traveled to Egypt to buy food, but while they are there, they are recognized by Joseph, but they do not recognize him. Joseph then spends a good bit of time just messing with them, definitely a little brother, and that is speaking as a little brother. Joseph became second in power only to Pharaoh during this troubled time. He had been placed in charge of the preparations for the coming famine collecting and storing grain, and then rationing and distributing the grain among the hungry people of Egypt and, notably, the surrounding lands. And through his careful and prudent planning, many people would survive the famine. The situation also caused uh, Jacob's sons to move their families and their flocks down to Egypt, which led over time to their enslavement, but that is another story we will take up another day in the book of Exodus. Today, instead, I wanted to talk about all that planning and all that preparation. In my ongoing sermon series on virtue, we turn to an often forgotten virtue, the virtue of prudence. This is not one of the headlining virtues like faith, hope, and love. It is not one of the oft-cited virtues used in sermons like courage, like justice. What is prudence? There are a few definitions. The ability to govern or to discipline oneself through the use of reason. Skill or good judgment in the use of resources. Caution or circumspection as to danger or risk. We could call prudence reasoned discipline, careful judgment, or even cautiousness. It's not the sexiest of virtues, which I would guess is why it does not generally get top billing. But then again, there was the old saying that an army marches on its stomach, meaning that it takes more than just bravery to win a battle. It takes caution, it takes care, it takes discipline, it takes planning, it takes prudence. How might we recognize prudence in our lives? Is it like buying bread and milk before the oncoming snowstorm? Is it reading up on an upcoming purchase, looking for the best options, the best recommendations? Or perhaps it's simply taking things slowly, not jumping to conclusions or making any decision without due diligence and deliberation. Prudence might come off as a fussy virtue, a small view of life rather than something big and grand like courage or love. But prudence is a virtue, meaning it is a good habit. And in one sense, it might be more significant than all the rest. Why, you might ask? Because prudence is said to be the beginning of all virtue. It is how all virtues come into being. I imagine the ability to discipline oneself and to turn towards reason is one way of starting on the virtuous path. But at its core, prudence is something very basic, something that every human being must face if they are to advance in life. Not with virtue, but with any real sense of living. Prudence is the first step that we take in order to conquer fear. Fear is one of the fundamental drives in our brain. That does not make fear good or healthy, but it is pervasive. It is a common emotion we all encounter in some manner and in varying degrees. Though I suppose there could be a person out there who is totally fearless. That seems something out of an epic poem or an Arthurian legend. And what would that person without fear look like? What would they act like? It might come off like bravery, I suppose, but really the truly brave do not ignore fear. They come to grips with it. They take action in spite of their fears while still being aware of it. You might call living without any sense of fear being careless or living without a care, which in my experience is a very highly unusual way of being. We need to care. We need to care if we are going to survive, and we need to care particularly if we plan on living amongst others. We learn things through fear. Fear offers the most enduring and memorable lessons, sadly. Again, that's not a good thing. 
but it helps you stay alive. And our feelings of fear lead to habits of caution. And caution is really what prudence means in the very simplest term. How we respond to fear, how we respond to danger, how we respond to the negative encounters we have. That is prudence. Conversely, to live in fear, that is a terrible state of being. So we respond to that negative state by learning ways to handle those feelings and those situations that lead to fear. Why do we buy milk and eggs when the snowstorm is coming? Because we have some fear that we might run out of food, even if that is an exaggerated fear. Uh, we read up on our pending purchases and investments out of fear that we might make the wrong choice, that we might lose money in the process. We slow down before we make our decisions because there are perhaps unknown risks that we will discover if we just take a bit of time and assess what is going on. And so with prudence, we can act justly or we can... And so with prudence, we can act justly rather than rashly, put it that way. We can act bravely rather than carelessly. We can act with a sense of moderation. We can act with a sense of hope, faith, and love. Because if we have not disciplined ourselves against that sort of primordial fear, fear can drown out any other feelings, any other thoughts that we have. And that fear can be the seed from which many of the so-called deadly sins might grow. Wrath is really just fear plus power. Envy is a form of fear that others have more than us, and greed is what that fear might turn into. Uncontrolled fear is never a good thing. But we have a strong built-in capacity to fear. If you or anyone you know has ever suffered with problems of anxiety, for example, you have may you have felt or you've seen the effects of such uncontrolled fear, such baseless and perhaps a disproportionate fear. And there is often a kernel of something underlying those many fears. Fear of high places, fear of loud noises, fear of things which could be harmful, but that our minds have allowed to swell beyond the immediate or likely scope of the problem. Fear has its purpose, and it can vastly exceed what is reasonable in a situation. Recently, there was a story in the news about suspicious activity at one of the local synagogues in the town of Brookline. The report said that a man was asking strange questions and the police were summoned. Now, that story may have sparked some fear in the people of Brookline and in the surrounding communities. What happened? Is there a threat somewhere? What's going on? How might I be affected? Now, the report did not go into much detail, so I will. Someone was indeed outside of one of the local synagogues, and they asked a few questions. It was a brief encounter with a security guard, which somehow got relayed to the police, perhaps out of an abundance of caution, perhaps because of the recent violent incident at a synagogue in Texas. Well, one of the rabbis of the congregation in Brookline spoke to a group of clergy about it. But at that time, no one in the congregation knew anything was happening. In fact, many didn't know about it until concerned outsiders who read the report called asking around if anyone knew what was happening. But nothing was happening. Nothing had happened. Nothing had happened except a ripple of fear had spread out among the local community. Fear of shadows rather than fear of anything real. Fear of a stranger somewhere asking questions. Fear of someone who looked out of place in a neighborhood. Fear of the other. Again, fear is natural, but fear is not good. It was evolutionarily useful. It kept us living longer. But these days, we are not running away from packs of wolves out in the woods. Our fight versus flight reactions, that, that feeling you get when you're afraid, that has some utility, and it can get out of hand. I scroll through a lot of different news sources, and I'm amazed and dismayed by the frequency with which fear is used to garner attention. For example, if you look at the website for the British Broadcasting Company, as I do, it will force you to look at the American, North American news content first. Invariably, there is a story about something terrible happening in Texas or Florida. Always Texas or Florida. 
And it's not a big news event necessarily like that recent incident in Colleyville, Texas. The last time I checked before writing this sermon, there was a story about a student hazing incident at a Texas Christian high school. This is a troubling story in its way, indeed, troubling to those in that school, troubling to those in that town. But why exactly was this troubling in the city of London? Because fear gets our attention. Fear that something bad is happening, even if that bad thing is very far away. Which means that our fear-sensitive, fear-prone brains you know, tell us that we need to be worried, we need to be vigilant, we need to read the story. We need to be afraid because something might happen right around the corner, even though that source of fear is thousands of miles away. And so we are primed in this way to be afraid, even if it does us no good. Even if it is only something to weigh upon our hearts and minds rather than helping us out in any reasonable fashion. Prudence is not just about being careful. Prudence requires us to discipline our minds and our reactions to the world around us with reason. And reason suggests that we should not be worried about an incident that is very far away from us. Reason suggests that we should not listen to fearful accounts about distant places or unfounded rumors about the people around us. And yet we worry, yet we fret, even if it is just for that moment. We feel a jolt of fear even if it fades after we turn the page, after we turn the channel. In the Bible, there is an often used phrase, fear of the Lord. It is sometimes rendered as a sense of awe, but in many cases, it means exactly that. The people are afraid of God. Afraid of God's wrath, afraid of God's judgment, afraid of standing in the presence of God when our time upon the earth is finally done. I have never liked this idea of the fear of the Lord. Not because I don't occasionally stand in awe of creation, not because I don't have moments of my own existential anxiety, but because there is no reason to fear God. There is absolutely no reason to fear God. When I hear the phrase fear of the Lord, I immediately think of the book of Job. Think about the whirlwind that appears at the end of the book. One does, in case you were wondering. And throughout the text, Job is lamenting his terrible downcast fate. He is crying to the heavens, seeking an answer, demanding that God explain why Job is suffering so greatly. And in the book of Job, God responds in the form of the whirlwind. From a storm, God asks Job a barrage of questions. And God in the story is not terribly gentle about it. Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you declare to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like this? It goes on and on. And after reading this passage, you might come away with a sense that God is really terrifying, that God might even be cruel. But what if really something else is going on here? What if it is simply a terrible whirlwind? It is a heartless threat of nature that doesn't care one way or another about Job or anything that stands in the way of the tornado, the hurricane, or the earthquake. What if God, what if God is not saying a word here? What if it is Job, or the author of the book of Job, telling us to stand in fear of nature rather than God? In the story of Joseph and his brothers, the people had prepared for a time of famine. And that is a terrible calamity, one that could destroy many, many lives. But instead of running around in fear, instead of just cursing the heavens, they planned against the possibility that people were going to be left hungry. That's what it means to be prudent. To undertake, to, I mean, to understand the dangers and the threats before us, and then to undertake to prepare how we, ha how we respond to those dangers. That is not simply getting bread and milk before the storm. That is stepping back and preparing for the challenges and the crises that might reasonably come in our lives. Prudence is not about abolishing all of our fears. It is about pausing. It is about planning. 
It is about assessing the scope of what is going on and what will be needed. And it is about keeping it all in perspective. That is where modern society seems to be having its greatest challenge. Realizing that we are spending so much of our time and so much of our mental energy fearing the wrong things, or fearing things well out of proportion to the actual challenges that we face. We are called upon to be prudent, to take hold of our fears as best that we can, and to prepare ourselves to care for others, for ourselves as well, but also for the world around us. That effort to discipline our fear is the first step that we can take towards having a good life. And even if we have done our best over the years to be prudent, it is a good reminder that the fears of our youth and the fears of our middle age and the fears of our elder years, those are all different. We need to return again and again to this discipline we showed, you know, we, we learned as children and we learned as adults and that we need to learn time and time again. And we need to help those around us to navigate their fears, to gain a sense of prudence to stand with them through their fears and to help them take their own step back from the cloud of worry and anxiety that can cloak us if we are not careful. Prudent is the decision we take to face our fears, to try to tame them with reason and planning and care. But that doesn't mean that the fears will immediately evaporate and they sadly do not disappear right away or even ever. Prudence means that we build up our ability to remain rational, or mostly rational, even when we are afraid, and to use reason to determine whether we truly need to be afraid in any particular moment. It's not magic. It is establishing the good habits of pausing, taking a breath, and stepping back from our fears to see what is really going on. And sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes, that will be the whirlwind. Sometimes it will be a fear that strikes us close to home. And sometimes, many times now, it will be us jumping at shadows. Shadows that hold nothing more than our fear of the dark. Prudence will not make every fear go away, as I've said, but prudence can help us cut those fears down to size and to help build us up for the challenges and for the journey. Amen. end our time together in prayer, please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our service is ended. May our service to God and to one another never truly end. Be safe, be well. God bless you all, and goodbye.